So going back to the basics, we're going to explore uh, combustion. Of course, that involves the discussion of the combustion triangle. What we're essentially looking at here to have a complete triangle is three sides. So at the upper apex, we have some sort of an ignition source, something that triggers our reaction, something that's hot. Uh, lower left, we have some type of fuel, carbon-based. It could be paper. It could be rubbish, uh, natural gas, oil, coal anything with free carbon. On the right-hand side, we have air. That can either be the air that we breathe, or it can be pure oxygen, or it can be some combination in mixture thereof. It's going to react in the right proportions for clean, stable combustion. All three are required. Okay. There's really two aspects of the uh, combustion process, one being mechanical and one being chemical. And while these things happen instantaneously, if you were to look at it at a very low rate, a, a very high-speed camera, if you will, you would find that there's an awful lot occurring that is really pretty invisible to the eye. If you go back, uh, perhaps, to your youth when you might have taken a soda water bottle, put a rubber a balloon over the mouth, and you drop it in a, a pot of hot water, what you would find is as the volume of air entrapped in the bottle and the balloon warms, the balloon starts to expand. Well, we know for a fact we're not adding any more air to that bottle. What's really happening is we're adding energy to the molecules, and as they start to bounce off of each other with ever-increasing force, we're changing the pressure, even though the volume has not changed. So we're adding energy to that. We're causing the molecule, uh, molecular action to increase in violence. Much the same way, if we're mixing fuel and air, we can warm it, to change the reaction, but essentially at room temperature, it's very much the same. There's a lot of random molecular motion. It's, it's stable. Not much really happens. If we, though, introduce an ignition source, which could either be a hot ember, a spark, a hot surface igniter, <laughs> something that can actually uh, warm the fuel or mixture past that 1,200 or so degree mark, and this is for natural gas again, will start to change and affect a reaction. Bonds will break, the beginning of com uh, combustion, the reaction itself will occur. And even in the absence of that initial spark or hot surface, the combustion reaction will, will perpetuate, meaning the fuel and air envelope that's now ignited and liberating heat liberates heat to the incoming fuel and air mixture, thus perpetuating the process. So while some burners have to maintain uh, a source of ignition, uh, in theory, under most conditions, that, that a continuous ignition source is not always necessary. In a chemical sense, uh, occurring really pretty much concurrently, there are six discrete steps in the natural gas combustion process. There's primary and secondary alcohols. There's formaldehyde, acid, carbon monoxide. When we allow this story to play out to completion without inhibiting it in any step, we will end up with water, carbon dioxide, visible light, and heat. Ultimately, it's generally the heat that we want, not so much the other elements, but they come along as part of this chemical reaction. And again, if we try to halt this at any stage, we'll end up with this the undesirable byproducts, and that, of course, is what we want to avoid. Gee, so, so what you're saying then, John, if I'm understanding this correctly, is carbon monoxide is not a natural end product of combustion. Not when it's done properly. Not when it's if, done properly. If we operate... Uh, in, in ways that we'll discuss later, will generate carbon monoxide, which again is a tasteless, colorless, odorless, poisonous gas. And we absolutely want to avoid that, not only for keeping our environment clean and preventing physical risk, but that also co uh, compromises efficiency. It costs us more money to heat a process when we're sending the fuel that we so dearly paid for up the stack. So we want to avoid that. Plus, it can ultimately, as we'll discover later, lead to soot, which is an insulator, which keeps our process a little further isolated from the heat source, which we want to avoid. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to calibrate us just just for okay. a, just for a second here. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to go back one slide. Okay, all right, because you've done a, a really good job of explaining the mechanical and the chemical processes. Mm -hmm. now, all of you sitting out there should thank me for not showing you six organic <laughs> chemical <laughs> equations uh, on that six stage process. But I'm going to take us back just one slide when you did the combustion triangle. Mm -hmm. And, and I was going to ask you a question there, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to ask the audience to kind of play around, play along a little bit. Okay. Okay. So the question that I'm going to ask John to answer in a couple of seconds is, 
you know, think of striking an old uh, wooden match against a, a fence post, okay? And that's how you light that match, okay? So if I ask all of you out there, just for 10 or 15 seconds, think of it in light of that triangle. What do you think's going on there? You know, kind of get the answer in your mind as to what's happening when you light that match. All right? Do, 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 do. Okay, John. Okay. So, so, so tell us what's happening. Okay. So we have a fuel supply, which actually is compound in that we have sulfur on the tip of the, the wooden stick. We have our ignition source, which is really friction, right? When you rub the tip of the, the match against some, some hard surface at the molecular level, even though you may not be able to feel it if you immediately put your finger on the tip, but at the molecular level, there are certain atoms that are being heated past some point where they will ignite. Obviously, our initial fuel source is the sulfur, but our ultimate fuel source is the wood. So uh, in a nutshell, you've got an ignition source of fuel, air. You've got the combustion triangle with a, with a farmer's match. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's keep moving Everyone forward. Everyone is right, of course. I'm they, they sure got everybody had that right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so let's go uh, and talk about it a little bit from, uh, you know, what goes in and what comes out so people can get more of a, a view of it from an equation standpoint. And we probably just took a huge leap here, but again, keeping it moving. Uh, what we're doing here is taking an example, uh, natural gas and combustion air. And what we're thinking here is the air that we breathe, which is about 79% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. It's really not exactly that. There's some trace gases of other types, but we can summarize it this way. Uh, there will be a, about a 10 to 1 ratio under laboratory conditions, meaning we will need about 1 cubic foot of gas and about 10 cubic feet of air to hit that theoretical stoichiometric mix. So explain that long word, stoichiometric. Stoichiometric would be uh, those proportions required for perfect combustion, which really <clears throat> rarely ever occurs in the real world. Uh, generally, you'll see instead of about a 10 to 1, you might see 11 or 12 to 1 under good conditions. Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. But whether you're talking about a 100 cubic feet of gas, which is about a therm, uh, or a million, uh, the proportions are what we're really looking at in this slide. So, for example, with natural gas at 100 cubic feet of volume, 1,000 cubic feet of air, we will end up, hopefully, when we're done, with one pound of water about 59 pounds of nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, which of course is what we exhale. There will be some light involved and we'll get about a therm of heat. Now I say about because natural gas is sold by volume, but there's always a, a heat uh, coefficient that's applied by a utility vendor which corrects for differences in BTU content per cubic foot. So what you won't see on the right-hand side are any of the nasties that we talked about in the previous slides. where. You don't see any carbon monoxide. You don't see anything else here that we don't really want. Now, again, this is uh, our desired end result. What you'll see in blue on the bottom, though, is excess air. And what does that mean? What that means is air that's provided to the process above and beyond what's really uh, required. We do that only to assure that we completely oxidize all the carbon contained in the natural gas. So we prevent any formation of carbon monoxide. And as we'll learn in a little bit again, we can't always per uh, perfectly mix the fuel and the air initially. And therefore, we need to provide some excess air into the process to prevent uh, free carbon from becoming carbon monoxide. And a therm being 100,000 BTUs of heat. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a slide. Would you probably, we're going to spend a fair amount of time on this. And um, while it may not be the single most important takeaway from what we do today, it's pretty darn close to it. It, it really it, is. It does capture uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about. Um, and so if you think about that equation that we saw on the previous slide, this is a way to kind of take it and put it into a pictorial format. And I'll let John then go ahead uh, and, and, and talk us through this. Yeah, it really is, is something to dwell on. Now, uh, as a caveat, this curve will change based on the fuel type used. But in general, it'll have a very similar shape for many, many fuels. And I'll start off at the bottom with some explanation. On the prior slide, we were talking about that example of 100 cubic feet of gas and about 1,000 cubic feet of air for oxidizing all the fuel. That's our theoretical. 100%. Uh, the vertical line in the center is what we'd be referring to there. 
it's neither fuel rich nor fuel lean. It's just right. It's stoichiometric. It's what's required for perfect combustion in a, in a laboratory. What we see is to the right hand side of the John, curve. let me just stop uh -huh. for one second. Can you explain? Oh, okay. As well? Okay. Uh, let me just dwell on the x-axis first. Okay. On the x-axis, the 100 is where we would want it to be. As we move to the right, we're actually adding more excess air to the process. So we're going above and beyond providing the free oxygen required to oxidize all the fuel that we're supplying. That's very important because, again, we want to provide more perhaps than needed so we assure that we burn it all. But as we live further and further to the right of the 100% theoretical air portion, we're actually costing money. We're reducing efficiency because now we have to heat all this excess air that goes through our combustion application and ultimately goes out the stack. It's doing no effective work. It's, it's a safety margin, if you will, to prevent formation of carbon monoxide. So, so two things to tie this back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So when we were, when we're at 100 percent, right in here, right. that is essentially the prior slide without the blue excess exactly. air. Okay. Exactly. And then as we add excess air, we move to the right on this chart. Exactly. And if you remember on, on John's previous slide, there were no quantities or no volume of excess air. Because that, that will change as we move up on exactly. the Exactly. Right. When you're setting the burner up, if you're responsible for that, or when you're watching someone do it, as they increase the theoretical excess air, we're now reducing flame temperatures. More of that energy is leaving unused. And this is important to also understand that the air we breathe, we, we only use the oxygen portion of that air. The rest of it's a vehicle to expel carbon dioxide. In a similar sense, when you're dealing with the combustion equation, 79% of the volume passing through your combustion application is not consumed or used by that combustion application. So when you think about that, it's compromised in efficiency already. Adding excess air only further comp uh, reduces its, uh, its efficiency. Okay. And that we can point to in a number of ways. If you think about uh, natural gas with pure oxygen, our theoretical flame temperatures are over 5,000 degrees. Once you start using air that we breathe, where 79% of it passes through the equation and robs heat, the actual theoretical flame temperature drops to below 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, this is very important to, to think about as we maintain that safety margin on the right-hand side. 